like to introduce uh, this week's speakers. Uh, we, have a, we have a double billing this week. Uh, first is uh, my friend and colleague, Professor Andy Singer. Uh, Andy uh, got his PhD in 1996 uh, from a small vocational school in Boston called uh, MIT. Uh, MIT. Uh, I don't know what they do there, uh, but he got his PhD in electrical computer engineering. Uh, and in 1998, uh, he joined the faculty here at the University of Illinois. He's a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, he is director of the Technology and, Entre and Entrepreneur Center. Uh, tech is one of the great engines of innovation on campus and hopefully is not only bringing uh, things like uh, great lecture series to the public, but also the technology that we develop here. Uh, and he's also the co-founder of a company in 2000 uh, called Intersymbol Communications Inc. Uh, a company that specializes in optical communications, despite the fact that he's going to talk about acoustics today, uh, which was acquired a few years after that by uh, Finisar, now traded publicly. Uh, Professor Oltsy, Professor Michael Oltsy, my other good friend, occasional basketball uh, cohort, uh, and a 2000 graduate of, I've been told it's pronounced Ole Miss, uh, he's a graduate of Ole Miss in physics in 2000. Uh, Michael is a, a Fulbright Scholar, a Fellow of the American Institute for Ultrasound in Medicine, and he is regularly on the list of teachers ranked excellent by their students at this fine institution. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude for both of them, to both of them for bringing us a great talk today. The stage is yours, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Keep the applause coming, because if you don't, <laughs> Use this little air cannon. So we're going to talk today about uh, acoustics, and 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 I was just told to increase my acoustics. So if you can't hear me, just say, "Hey, I can't hear you." I want to treat this like one of my lectures where uh, the students uh, do uh, all their best to make sure that I know if they're not able to pay attention. Uh, feel free to interrupt, ask questions, say, "Hey, what is that?" Whatever you want to do. Um, this is supposed to be an interactive, fun uh, exploration of acoustics and sound. Um, and the title is, Hey Nemo, Can You Hear Me Now? Because in particular, I want to talk about, or we want to talk about, sound underwater. So, well, what is sound? Um, what would life be like without sound? So, with sound, we have... to a great movie that came out when I was a kid. Um, so what would this be like if you went to the movies and that's what you had? Now, many of you are probably not old enough to remember that movies were like that, but sound is an extremely important part of the way that we communicate, the way that we send information, uh, and, and the way that we as, as animals and as beings uh, interact with the world around us. Um, so this talk is about communication using sound, um, and we all know at least one way that we can communicate using sound, and I'm using that right now, right? We were developed as, as humans to be able to communicate with one another, or I can make sounds, and now you can understand what I'm saying, hopefully. Um, at some point, we figured out how to put the, that sound into electrical signals that we could put over a telephone network, and then we could use sound to communicate over very long distances. We also use sounds in a similar way that animals do to warn one another that something important is happening, right? We might put a siren on top of a car or an emergency vehicle to say, hey, get out of the way, there's something important coming. And then we can also use sound to express beauty in the arts through music. Um, sound has also made its way into science and engineering, and uh, Professor Olsey will talk extensively about uh, some of the applications. At some point, yeah. So uh, obviously you see... Uh we have a picture of a, a little fetus inside of the belly of a mother. So we use ultrasound throughout the world, all, every day, millions of times a day, to image, uh, image human beings and do all sorts of medical diagnostics with that. So we'll talk a little bit about that a little, uh, later and actually have some little demos of some interesting objects. A lot of your cars probably use ultrasound right now to measure distances when you're backing up and trying to not run over the garbage can or skateboard or something like that. Uh, and any of you involved in first Lego League Robotics? Only two? 
Okay, you got to learn about FLL and about three. Okay, good. FLL robotics. So, uh, what I brought in was just a little brain from one of the uh, uh, Mindstorms NXTs, and it's got a little ultrasonic sensor in it that can be used to measure distances. So, one of the things that I know that Jonah used in his robot was to figure out how to drive a certain distance and then know when you're 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters away from an object just by using ultrasound. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about extensively today is communication using sound. And I think we want to start off. Yes. Could you explain the difference between sound and ultrasound? Sound versus ultrasound. Well, I, I guess there are three ranges of sound, and it's broken down into frequencies. So we say, uh, I don't know, a few hertz, so a few times a second that you have sound. That's called infrasound. And then we have the range that we can actually hear. So that goes up to about 20 kilohertz. Uh, depending on how old you are. So as you age, you can hear, but you can't hear as, as uh, high frequency sound. So they make these uh, new devices to keep teenagers away from areas by having a very high pitched sound that's very annoying to them, but you know, adults, <laughs> old people can't hear it. So it's a nice use of uh, yes, technology today. And then ultrasound is above that threshold of hearing. So that's what uh, ultrasound did. Does it sing dog whistle? Dog whistle, yes, except the teenage whistle. Make it a dog <laughs> Yeah, so I've got, uh, you got to play something that uh, anybody can't hear. Exactly. Let's see. So, so Michael was talking about frequencies. Lower frequencies have lower notes, lower tones. As I increase the frequency, it gets higher and higher and higher, and eventually all the parents won't complain anymore, but the kids will still be upset. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, right there. That's good for me. I don't know about that. What are you talking about? So, so for me, that's, for me, that's almost ultrasound. I can't hear it. But I bet that hurts your ears. <laughs> so mom and dad, you know, uh, dog whistle, it's really easy. When you want the kids to stop, just turn it right on. Can, that was only about 12 kilohertz for me. I can go all the way up to about 17, 18 kilohertz. Can anyone still hear that? No. So I'm up above human hearing. Oh, she can still hear it. There you go. Young ears. Okay, I'll stop. So ultrasound is so high frequency, you're not going to hear it. The wavelength gets shorter and shorter. The frequency gets higher and higher. And we can use it to image things. We can use it to see things very precisely. Um, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit later in the talk, but I'm going to give a demo right up front to show you how we use it is underwater acoustic digital communications. That's like underwater acoustic, that's four words that are long, so this is a really important talk. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we do um, to send information in the air over electronic devices is we, is we uh, use radio frequency waves. We use RF uh, to send electromagnetic waves from, an, from a tower to your cell phone, from uh, your cell phone, maybe over Bluetooth to another device. Um, but those types of uh, uh, electromagnetic waves don't propagate um, through the deep oceans, through salt water. So we have to send information another way. And we've learned from, um, well, from animals that sound can travel very long distances underwater. And the, uh, the Navy, the oil and gas industry, anyone that wants to do anything under the deep oceans uh, has to communicate using sound. And at the very bottom of the ocean, there's a lot of pressure, it's really dark, it's really cold. So if you want to do anything important and, and heavy down there, we use robots, big robots, expensive robots. And we have to control them using, we have to control them remotely, and we do so uh, uh, using sound. So uh, in this picture, you'll see, in this picture, you'll see uh, a surface ship that has something called a modem on it which is modulating and demodulating information and sending it down to an autonomous underwater vehicle that's moving around uh, underwater. And we have a little demonstration right here where uh, Andrew Bean, one of my graduate students, will have to take a volunteer. And I think there's a, a woman right behind you who's got very long, lovely hair. <coughs> She's a perfect victim for this experiment. Can you get her in there? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me straighten up that hair. I'm, I'm going to propagate some air. Right there. there we go. It's just about perfect. 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a picture. I'm going to take that picture, which is an image stored on the computer, and we're going to turn it into binary information, and I'll talk more about that later. And then we'll take that binary information and we're going to turn it into sound waves. And those sound waves are going to go through this audio amplifier, and they're going to come through this wire, and they're going to come out this speaker. So this is an underwater speaker that you might find in a swimming pool in your backyard if you happen to do, I don't know, Olympic synchronized swimming or something like that. <laughs> and then those sound waves are going to propagate those ones and zeros all the way over to this microphone. It's an underwater microphone. Don't try this at home with mom's microphone. And then that acoustic signal, after it's turned into an electric signal by this microphone, is going to come back into this prox and then into his computer and he's going to decode it and we'll get the image back. And if all works, you won't get scrambled, we'll be able to reassemble you. <laughs> can anyone hear it? Is she in there? Oh, there you are. contributions to our understanding of sound. You got to talk about this guy named Lord Rayleigh. No one really calls him by John Williams, but it's always Lord Rayleigh. He's a famous guy. He wrote, uh, wrote a famous textbook on the theory of sound that really is still used today. I mean, it's uh, kind of the, the textbook on sound waves. He actually explained why the sky is blue, so you might want to know this guy a little bit. He's got a unit called the rail, which is a fundamental unit of uh, acoustics and impedance. Hey, I <laughs> Wait a minute. Through the water. Wait a minute. There she is. She went through the water and she's not even wet. <laughs> so she was reassembled and put back together. We'll talk about uh, how that happened towards the end of the talk. Um, so another way that we can communicate using sound is by sending sound. Uh, has anyone ever tried this with tin cans and string? We don't have any string here, but. You tried it before? Can you make this work? Do you have some string? We forgot our string. We do the same thing. Our string broke. We do the same thing, sending our sound waves through a tube. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Good. Yes, it works. <laughs> We've got some toys that you can play with afterwards, including this one where we're overhearing your conversations by gathering the sound waves using this parabolic dish and then focusing them into this microphone. So even if you're really far away and whispering, I can still hear you. I can <laughs> so we learned about communicating using sound, well, because animals can communicate using sound. In fact, animals can communicate for very, very long distances using sound, hundreds or even thousands of miles. Uh, their their uh, dolphin and whale uh, songs can, can propagate. Uh, we'll, we'll see that uh, we've learned that, that many animals use sound to fight. They use it as a weapon, and they use it to locate. Just like this ultrasonic device can figure out where things are, bats can use sound to figure out where they are uh, while flying. They, you know, has anyone heard the, the term "blind as a bat"? So bats can't see very well, but they can see pretty well using ultrasound. So, what do animals say when they're underwater? Apparently nothing. Apparently nothing. sounds like that was a humpback whale recorded uh, off the coast of Alaska. Um, what's this? Raindrops. Raindrops. How many big popcorn? 
raindrops, shrimp, <laughs> french fries, <laughs> fire. It's a snapping shrimp. So we learn a lot about sound by um, learning about this shrimp. If you could see, this shrimp has one small claw and one really big claw. And that really big claw is amazing. Um, he closes that claw, opens and closes that claw really fast. See that little jet? So he closes his claw so fast that a stream of water squirts out at such high pressure that it, behind it, it decreases the pressure and you get this big balloon of air that slams shut. And when that slams shut, I don't know if you'll really see it on this, it slams shut with such intensity. Do you see that pop of light? 5,000 degrees Kelvin at that, at that pop of light. It's almost the temperature of the surface of the sun. There's so much pressure. So one little shrimp can make a, a bubble that's, that's so, that move, the water moves so fast that it creates a bubble that's so intense that it can recreate the temperature on the surface of the sun. Now, the shrimp uses this to communicate with one another. They use it to damage and kill and stun prey. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, um, uh, if, you're, if you're in a submarine and you want to find out whether or not you're close to shore, if you can hear snapping shrimp, then you know that you're in an area where the shrimp will grow and you can find a way. Uh, another place that we've run into uh, acoustics and sound that's probably very familiar to many of you is this one. So what's happening here? It's raining. What's the flash of light that I see? Lightning. Lightning, yeah. Why do I see the flash of light first and then I hear the thunder later? does come before thunder. Why does it come before thunder? Light is faster than sound. Exactly. So it has to do with the relative di uh, difference between the speed of sound and the speed of light. And uh, Sir Isaac Newton was one of the first people to postulate a theory for uh, uh, the speed of sound. And in the 1660s, uh, two Italian physicists were the first to try and record the speed of sound. They did it much like lightning. They, they shot a gun and they saw the gun fire, and they counted how long it would take, recorded how long it would take to hear the report. Uh, and from that, they were able to calculate the speed of sound. And by the way, Sir Isaac Newton got it wrong. So, and he's still a famous guy. So you can get things wrong. And he was be, a sir. And he was a sir. He was a knight. So, he was a sword and everything. so the difference uh, between the propagation of, of the light that you see from lightning, which travels at about 300 million meters per second, or three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and the speed of sound in air, which is about 340 meters per second, or 3.4 times 10 to the two meters per second, it's about a million times slower. So that's why if you see lightning and you start counting, you can count about five seconds, and that's about how long it takes for that sound to travel one mile. So if you see lightning, you count one, two, three, four, five, and then you hear the thunder, it's a mile away. You can see the lightning and the tree falls down behind your house. Um, you don't really need to count. <laughs> so we want to do some experiments. We, we already sent... Um, <laughs> we did some experiments where we sent um, this lovely lady through the water. What we'd like to do is show you how you can calculate the speed of sound um, by propagating some tones over a measured distance. Um, well, uh, you want to do air first? We need sound, it's a uh, water that's already set up. Water. Water. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this one equation here. I was told I have to include a couple of equations to make this really educational for you. So this, this equation we have right here says that lambda times f equals c. What's lambda? Lambda is the wavelength. So that's the length of a single oscillation of the sound pressure wave uh, in the medium. And the frequency is how fast it's oscillating between a high intensity and a low intensity. And the product of those two gives us the speed of propagation. So how do I know that? Well, one way to check is by checking units. So the wavelength is in meters per cycle. So that's how many meters 
is required for one cycle of that uh, sinusoid. And the frequency is cycles per second. That's how fast it's oscillating between high and low. And then when I multiply those two together, the cycles cancel and I get meters per second. So I can calculate the speed of propagation in a medium uh, if I fix, for example, uh, the frequency and I measure the wavelength, then I can just multiply them together and get the speed of propagation. So what Andrew's doing now is he's going to create a sine wave of a particular frequency and we're going to send it through the water. Are you in water first? Yeah. And send it through the water. And what we'll do is we'll move, I've got the speaker over here and a microphone over here, and we'll move the microphone as much as we have to in order for that single oscillation to happen. And that'll tell us one wavelength. And if I take the product then of the frequency and the wavelength, then I'll get the speed of sound. Right. Want to start right there? We will mark your some duct tape. You need duct tape for everything, including acoustic experiments. You mark your point in the tank. So we're sending a sine wave here that's been clipped to look like a square wave. It's yeah. At, it's at 19. The water's moving, so you can see it. Yeah, you can see the, the, the uh, reflection off the top of the street. It's at 19 uh, kilohertz, 19,000 times per second. So I can't hear it, but maybe some of the kids can hear it. Um, and it's making its way to the speaker. Now I'm going to move, sorry, to the microphone. Now I'm going to move the microphone. And those of you that are in front might see the phase is shifting. I'm sliding that wavelength over, over, over. Tell me when to stop. Keep going. Anyway. There might be a standing one. Okay. Is that back to the start? Back to the start. Are you moving? I'm not moving. The water's moving a little bit. That's yeah. Let's try that. Almost there. Stick my hand in it. And yeah. okay. Excellent. So we got seventeen and a half centimeters. Sixteen eighty. Well, a little bit high. A little bit high. Now let's do an air. The speed of sound in water is about 1480, 1500 meters per second. We got measured about 1600, so we're off a little bit. But you know, it's like Sir Isaac Newton off, so we're, we're okay. Yeah. 
Anita. They're the good looking ones. <laughs> frequency went lower. So that's called the Doppler effect. And it happens because uh, a stationary source that's emitting sound sends that same sound in all directions. If it's an omnidirectional source, that means it's sending the same sound in all directions. But if that sound emitting source starts moving, what I'm showing here is for those uh, sine waves that are emitting, little uh, bright circles that you see, the bright blue circles that you see are, are the, are the, the um, high points in that sine wave, and the dark circles are the low points in that sine wave. And if this red dot starts moving to the right, then to someone who's observing, who's watching the, the, or listening to the sound over here, all those sine waves that are coming towards me get squeezed closer and closer together. So they start to have a higher frequency or shorter wavelength. And to someone who's on the other side, they start to get stretched further and further apart. They get a longer wavelength or lower frequency. <coughs> now the experiment that, we, that I showed you before, that we sent, um, what's your name? I've been talking about you all day and I don't even know your name. Irene. Irene. We sent Irene through the water and she miraculously appeared over here. We use something called underwater acoustic digital communications. So underwater, you understand, acoustic means that we use sound. What does digital mean? What does digital mean? Ones and zeros, yeah. So we sent Irene through the water using ones and zeros. And communication means that we were trying to send information. Now, up until around 1990, a lot of the famous acousticians in the world, people that worked with the Navy, people that worked with all sorts of underwater companies, uh, thought that it was actually impossible to send um, digital information very fast through the water. And in fact, it was, it was assumed that phase coherent digital communications was not possible. But this woman, Melissa Stoyanovich, said, well, I don't care. I'm going to try and make it work anyway. And she figured out how to do it. And she used something called a phase lock loop and tracked the phase. And she showed us that you could send very high data rates of information through the water using an underwater acoustic modem, much like the modems, the ways that, that your parents connected to the internet a long time ago. So very quickly, I'm going to show you how that works. Don't, don't worry if you don't understand. I just want you, if you don't understand all the details, I want you to understand the basic process that we use to take Irene and put her through the water. And to make it simple, I'm going to say, suppose that instead I just want to send a text message, hi, mom, and I want to send it through the water. I take that text message, hi, mom, and I have to turn that into ones and zeros. Um, so if I'm going to send text, I'll use something called an ASCII code to turn each of these letters, H, I, space, M, O, M, 
into a sequence of ones and zeros using this lookup table. So H, I can look up over here and I can see capital H is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And at lowercase i is 0, 1, 1, 0, and so forth. So I can turn hi mom into this string of just ones and zeros. Now that I've got the strings of ones and zeros, or equivalently if I took a, a digital picture and I turned it into ones and zeros on, on the computer, I now have to figure out how to turn that into some sound. So now I do a little bit of math. I take my string of ones and zeros, and I'm going to multiply the ones and zeros by two. So two times zero is zero, two times one is two, and I'm going to subtract one. So that turns what? It turns all the zeros into minus ones and all the ones into ones. Okay? Then I multiply them by a sine wave. So here I'm going to use a cosine 2 pi f naught t. So f naught is my carrier frequency. And uh, for that example, what carrier frequency did you use? Uh, about 10k. About 10 kilohertz. Um, so if I just multiply this cosine by a plus 1 or a minus 1, what do you see? You see that, that the waveform either starts low and goes high and oscillates, or it starts high and goes low and oscillates. So I can just flip the sign by changing it from a 1 to a 0. And I can represent this entire string then by cosines of different phases that are strung together. Then, every once in a while, say every millisecond or microsecond, I can change the cosine that I'm going to use. And I can send a 0, then I can send a 1, then a 0, and a 0. And uh, I can send my data faster by changing the, how often I, I change the symbols. And I can send it at higher and higher frequencies by changing uh, the carrier frequency f naught. So what this looks like in a block diagram is I take my high mom, I turn it into ones and zeros, I change that into a, a cosine uh, every capital T seconds, um, uh, just multiplying this, this one and minus one uh, times my cosine, and I did this at a, at a low frequency here. So that's high that, that's high mom at about, uh, I think it's about two kilohertz. And the waveform will look like this, and then it goes through the water. Then what do you do at the receiver? At the receiver, I have to know a little bit of trigonometry. I was told, again, there will be some high school students here. So I can remember that cosine A, cosine B is half cosine A plus B, half cosine A minus B. Um, so if I take the receive signal, I multiply it by a cosine again, then I get the original signal that I had times a cosine. I get times the same cosine again, that's cosine squared. So I get my signal times a half plus my signal times a cosine at twice the frequency. Then I do something called low-pass filtering to just throw this part away, and I get back just my ones and zeros, and I reassemble them into bits, and I get high mod. So that's the mathematics behind underwater acoustic digital communication. Now I want to switch gears and talk about the use of sound for biomedical use. That's right. So you know we've been talking about sound underwater, and we want to talk about ultrasound, which. Um, you know, again, we're using ultrasound underwater, but at the same time, we're using ultrasound to look at human beings. And uh, if you think about it, it's kind of the same because really human beings were made up mostly of water, right? Well, except for our bones. So think of us as these bags of bones, bags of water with bones in, inside of it, right? So that's what uh, human beings are. And ultrasound is actually very prevalent. I mean, as you look at this graph here, this is the number of uh, ultrasounds that are done uh, in, what, 2011. So a little bit dated, but imagine that's grown even more. But that's 2,800 million, million procedures. Procedures per year. So that's 2.8 billion per year. That's ultrasound. You know, the only thing that uh, imaging modality that, that uh, folks use more is, is x-ray. So you look at that compared to nuclear, and CT, and MRI. Ultrasound is the most prevalently used or one of the most prevalently used uh, imaging techniques and diagnostic medicine. So, used everywhere, and it's got you know certain advantages over all these other imaging techniques, and it's safe. Right? So, a little bit of the history of ultrasound. So, the first ultrasound system came about because of what we did in World War II. You know, we were able to image subs and other things using acoustics, and so that led some uh, researchers to think, well, maybe we could use this to image human beings. So, these guys named Howry and Wild, Wild, he's got to be pretty wild to do what he did. Uh, did their first ultrasound imaging by, as you can see here, they dumped some guy in a big water tank. Actually, it was a, a, a water-filled gun turret from a B-29 bomber. So that was the first ultrasound imaging device for diagnostics for, for humans. Thank goodness that's not what happens today, right? So anytime you get an ultrasound, you don't have to get yourself in a big tank of water and have all these things going around you, right? So we've come a long way. In fact, if you look at uh, where ultrasound has come today, 
Now you can see these changes, right? I mean, you've got your original bomb turret ultrasound machine that uh, you know, hopefully none of us have had to go through, depending on how old you are maybe, I don't know. Um, now we've got these clinical devices here that uh, you can probably see that those are pretty standard in any hospital. They roll them around on carts and so forth. You can do lots of diagnostics. More than just imaging babies, imaging the heart and organs and all sorts of things like that. But in more recent years, this is where ultrasound is really beginning to take off, is that we can make it very small, very portable ultrasound devices. You see this uh, device here by a company called Sonosite, handheld ultrasound device, you can carry it with you everywhere. And more recently, just in the past couple of years, a new company has come along called Mobisante. And the idea behind Mobisante is that less than 50% of the world has access to you know, modern medical imaging devices. So that could be a problem, especially in some of these underdeveloped countries. However, it turns out that um, you know, people that do cell phones, they've got cell phone coverage in more than 80% of the world, 90% of the world. So cell phones do a lot better work of, of getting their product out there than medical devices. But ultrasound is so portable, what you can do then is you can hook it up to a phone, a cell phone like we have here in the bottom right corner. Uh, it only operates on Windows, so if you have Apple, sorry, it doesn't work on Apple phones yet, but you can hook up a little ultrasound transducer to your phone and uh, you know, go out to some, I don't know, some undeveloped country image people that may have some sort of a problem, and then use the uh, cell tower and send your image off to a radiologist in a hospital somewhere. They can read it and then diagnose what's going on with the, with, uh, the patient. So we see that ultrasound has come a long way and really it's going to help uh, global health by, by having these capabilities. We've also come a long way in terms of image formation. I mean, here's your conventional ultrasound image uh, over here on the left. You know, it's just a 2D image. You can kind of make out that there's a head there and, and a head right here and, and maybe the body right there. And all of you young people, you, you, you have pictures of yourself in this stage, right? But how many of you have a picture like this? This is ultrasound. So you can actually render the 3D image of the face there and know what your baby looks like before he's even born, if that's what you want to do, right? So ultrasound's come a long way in being able to image things and make these really incredible, fantastic images. And we've got all sorts of probes, probes that go where no man has gone before. Is the title of this, uh, and you can look at some of the shapes of these probes here and kind of get a feel for where some of them might go, I don't know. Um, but uh, <clears throat> This probe here on the bottom, that's a very unique probe. That's a probe that you can stick into your artery and a catheter, and you can snake it through there, and it kind of looks, looks around, you know, a little side-looking sonar type thing that can image plaques in the body and see if you've got blockages and things like that, and we place stents to make sure they're placed correctly. So ultrasound is used in so many things in, uh, in our world today and in medicine, and that's just kind of a, a basic you know, background of ultrasound imaging. And we actually have a portable ultrasound machine here today. In fact, I think we want to hook that sucker up. Let me turn it on here. And do a, a couple little demos. So who's first? <laughs> Got some probes. Got some probes. <laughs> uh, anybody want to get probes? This one? <clears throat> no, we're not going to do that. I, I've got something special today. So the way that an ultrasound uh, device works, and here's, here's our probe right here, okay? This is a probe that we brought today. And really what it does is it sends out a little, um, a short little ultrasound pulse that's, that's well defined in a small little region. That pulse goes out, it hits Andy in the head, comes back, and then we can image that, right? So we see uh, when it hits something, it comes back. If someone's behind him, we can see them coming back. So that's kind of the basic principles of ultrasound. We can confine our sound to a little bitty beam, to a short little distance, and image things. Well, <clears throat> I have to say that uh, today is a very, very special day because we're, we're going to be able to image something today that has never been imaged before by an ultrasound device. In fact, uh, we, we scoured the seas in order to find uh, a specimen uh, and do what we're going to about to do. So this is kind of a monumental uh, undertaking here, in that we are going to image the inside of a mermaid today. <laughs> yes. So you know it's never been done before. So you know we take our imaging probe here and uh, oh, it's gunk on it here. Let me wipe it off. And I try and image it, and 
Is it up? Yeah, see, I'm not really seeing much, am I, in sidetrack? And that's that's a problem. So, you know, it's not connecting very well with our with our mermaid. And one of the reasons why is because we have to do something called coupling. So when the sound uh, comes off of our transducer here, it's got uh, it's got this thing called impedance, right? So if it hits the air surface, and this is the transducer is kind of made of a hard material, the sound's just going to bounce off the surface of the transducer and come back. So in order to couple to our to our mermaid here, what I have brought is some gel. And this gel is going to help the sound to enter into our mermaid here. And hopefully we'll see what the inside of a mermaid looks like. And uh, this, is, this is being filmed, right? Excellent. All right. So mermaids do exist, right? And uh, we'll see what the inside of one looks like. Did we get the IRB for this, by the way? Uh, does that mermaid have a vertebra? She did, she's she's non-vertebrate, so we're good. All right. So what is the inside of a mermaid? Oh, wow. Look at that. Now it's really coupling. Yeah, I can see her liver right there, can't you? Huh? <laughs> she does have a liver. So that's, that's the inside of a mermaid, in case you ever wanted to see. Uh, and that's never been done before, as far as I know. Yes. Uh, one other thing I want to look at is, this is just water from the tap, right? And uh, let's see if this works. Hopefully it will. I'm going to lower this down here a little bit into the water. And uh, you can kind of see how good of resolution that we have. But you see little things floating around in your water. And maybe that's just, uh, you know, because it's been sitting here for an hour or two. But, uh, you know, I shake this up. And we have lots of, you can't really see from up there, but we've got lots of little bubbles in there. Lots of other little uh, particles swimming around in our water. But this ultrasound has such good resolution that you can see things that you couldn't see with the naked eye. So I stir it up. And maybe get a few more bubbles in there. Well, you can see the little bright spots just falling around in there. So that's stuff that you're drinking. So if you ever want to uh, test your water quality at home, purchase an ultrasound device, take it into your, your fill up a cup of water, take it in there, and see how much uh, material is floating around in your water. So there's an ultrasound. You can have it back. Uh, we talked about using sound to communicate. We talked about sound, using sound uh, to fight. Who fights with sound? Besides mom and dad. <laughs> Who fights with sound? The snapping shrimp, right? They made those bubbles and they would pop. Um, so, so sound can be used uh, to send information, and it sends information in the form of waves. And sometimes if um, uh, objects are moving extremely fast, then they can break the speed of sound and they can create shock waves, right? So when things happen really fast, or really hard, they can create shock waves, and the shock waves sound like a loud like clap, right? So one of the things that happens um, when something moves really fast and it creates those shock waves is you can you can see those shock waves. Let's see if I can see those shock waves. No, I can't see the shock. I see the shock waves. Stop. You can see the shock waves. So right now, when you all clap for the end of the talk, shock waves will come from right around where your hands are. And those shock waves will propagate through the entire auditorium. And it will be so loud that Professor Eden will be jealous that he didn't quite get the same rousing ovation that we got. talk officially there, but what I wanted to do was invite any of the young scientists up to come and observe some of the uh, devices that we have here uh, for measuring sound, for sending sound, for speaking through sound, for listening to conversations at long distances, and for measuring distances. Uh, at the same time, we're happy to answer any questions.